Hey, Kim. How are you? Hey, Brian. I'm good. How are you? Great. It's great to see you. Kim Milford joining us today. Introduce yourself in a second. No Aaron Shaver today. Uh, so we don't have Aaron to kick around. I know you were probably very much looking forward to, to that. Yeah, he's he's disappointing me even by not being here. <laughs> well, so we, we can't keep him in his place today. He uh, His place is somewhere else. So yeah, it is. It is, but uh, it's going to be going to be a great show. I'm really excited. Been looking forward to this one, and and really excited to have you on. So uh, if you could, uh, you and I go go back a long time. But uh, if you could introduce yourself to the to the handfuls and handfuls of people that will watch our show. That's right up my alley. I like the small crowd here. <laughs> Uh, I am Kim Milford. I am the executive director with the Research and Education Networks Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Very long name. We'll get into that a little bit more if you want to know some of the history and why all those words. <laughs> awesome. And um, and that uh, that group is hosted at uh, my my beloved alma mater. <laughs> um, Indi yeah, Indiana University, but uh, you're, you're, if I remember correctly, you're like a Wisconsin grad, is that the, or no, you worked at Wisconsin. Yeah, I worked at Wisconsin. I've worked at three higher ed institutions, including IU, and before that, University of Rochester, and before that, University of Wisconsin. Um, I am a St. Louis University oh, graduate. Slew. SLU for my undergrad, and then I went to John Marshall Law School in Chicago, Illinois. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's that's uh, that's awesome. And then, and Ren Isaac, of course, you know, isn't specifically about any one university, and you serve the yes. the higher ed uh, university community in in general, exactly. and, and probably some other folks. Cool. Yeah. Well, we're uh, as you said, uh, information sharing and analysis and uh we're going to talk about isacs and and what they do and 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 what that all means uh after our little after a little transition here here we go <music> Always exciting. Sorry, I, was, I was busy dancing. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, ISACs, uh, what is it? What's an ISAC? I mean, I've been a member of one, um, so I should know better, but I can credibly tell you uh, or ask, I can credibly ask, what's an ISAC, Kim? <laughs> so, I can give you the official um, background. <laughs> Uh, ISACs were created by a presidential direct, presidential something directive, PDD 63, in 1998. And it suggested that each sector of the critical infrastructure set up an information sharing analysis center around threats and protections. And it, it specifically said physical and cyber threats. I don't think it used cyber because we didn't talk about cyber back in those days. It was some other word, but you know, something along oh, those lines. Like physical threats initially yes. is the focus. I wasn't even aware. That's interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, the, and by including that, they were able to draw on, on the rich tradition of what was happening at the U.S. government around um, exercises and, um, you know, protecting uh, FEMA sorts of things, right? Protecting yeah. against... Uh, major 
weather outages or fires or things like that. Yeah. So, uh, so that became, in a way, because of that, that became a model for a lot of how we do things in, in um, cyber incidents too, um, for good or for bad, mainly for good, but there are some issues. Now, the problem with the directive and the beginning of the ICE Acts, that's still a point of confusion, information sharing and analysis, nobody knows what sort of information we're sharing. <laughs> Well, there goes there goes our show because that's what I wanted to. <laughs> that's kind of like I love the words, you know. Uh, I um, who would be against uh, uh, information sharing? I'm for it, and also analysis sounds great. Um, so, 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 yeah, is is that it's it kind of differs among the ISACs or across the industry, or you know, what does that mean? What kind of information? Do you share and what do you analyze and what analysis do you do you produce uh, in an ISAC? So uh, again, we're going to go back to the, the origins. So a lot of the physical things came out of a military setting, right? And information sharing, not so much, right? They were about information holding clothes, <laughs> yeah. information hoarding, um, for for obvious reasons, because yeah. you know loose link, loose lips sink ships, right? So right. it was sort of with that background. So this idea of 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 sharing information amongst people in a critical infrastructure, um, you know, organizations was pretty novel at the time. And not only that, but it talked, you know, it really was one of the the strongest, most successful examples of a private public partnership. So all of a sudden we were sharing with each other, we were sharing across ISACs for the first time. And then we were also sharing with our friends in the federal government yeah. um, without being mandated to share, without being forced to share. So uh, so it, even though it seems like this is a no brainer, it, it was a big deal back in 98. Yeah, I, I, I hear you of like, so there's this whole, I, you know, I think my, my goofy title for this episode was sharing is caring, but I also, I put myself into, um, because it's public private partnership, you know, I, I think about companies that I've worked in where there is some hesitancy around sharing too. And I, I'd like to talk about that, but to, to, to name it, it's that the sharing is great when I receive sharing, you know, of, do I, you know, if you were to ask the question, do I want information about threats that are occurring to other people in my industry? Well, the answer would almost universally be yes, I would love to have that information. On the flip side, when you say, as either a condition of that membership, or, you know, even in the spirit of that membership, shouldn't we also share detailed information about bad things that happen to us? I know that that um, in, in companies that makes people twitch, certain types of people uh, in particular, it makes executives inside of those companies a little concerned. Sometimes, you know, attorneys get very, wait, we're telling people like, we're telling people what about we're what airing happened? our dirty laundry. Yeah, exactly. And so how, how do ISACs deal with that sort of that, you know, I, I think there is a, a disincentive inside of organizations to, you know, get the sharing of information. Great. You know, share myself, the dirty laundry, maybe not so much. So how's that, how's that handled in the industry or, or even so, sharing with the government. I mean, there's this genuine fear, I think, of how will how might this not just, you know, uh, in business, you, uh, will this get in the hands of plaintiffs' attorneys or the, will this be used by regulators to bring, you know, enforcement actions or to harm me, essentially? Yeah, and, and that's that's the crux of, of the delicacy for us. Um, with in the ISAC community. So we, first of all, the legal guidance is an ebb and flow. So it's risk averse, risk tolerant over and over and over. Right. And so we'll, we'll get to where that they're, they're a little bit more, our, our general counsel 
councils across all the ISACs are a little more tolerant. Say, okay, yeah, you could, I think you could share that. That sounds okay. And then something will happen and that'll dry up. For instance, the target brief breach, I'm going to pick on target for a second, um, where it came out exactly what happened there. And then we started seeing a bunch of darn copycats because that's the way it works, you know, and they were probably already operating in that supplier sphere, but we just didn't know about it until then. So, so then everyone kind of dried up and we see this even in the research and education community. Um, right now we're sort of at a, like nobody's talking about ransomware. And if somebody would talk, actually that's not true. Many institutions that have suffered a ransomware attack are not talking about it. And, uh, and I can totally understand why, because there's a lot of reputational issues around that. Yeah. Um, but the few that do help us all, and um, and so I get to actually, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I try not to name names, but sometimes it's good to have an example. Um, and Michigan State had a ransomware attack, and they shared quite a bit about it, and they've talked about it yeah. at conferences and everything, and we've all been able to learn from it. So that has was really helpful to everyone, and so that's what you know. Whenever I see a breach. I, you know, I go to the, the university and say, is there anything we can do to help as a community? Yeah. And then secondly, would you think about sharing? And I said, even writing something up and what we can do, we have a, you know, we have a private community that nobody, the, you know, the vendors aren't going to come ambulance chasing because you present about it. You don't have to, you don't have to talk about IP addresses. Please don't talk about IP addresses. Don't talk about user accounts, you know, and name accounts. Um, but just so keep it general, aggregated, high level, yeah. and then um, then you are welcome to share. And we just close the doors and make it just about our sector, so our members, you know. Yeah. So uh, so we can we can help that way. We also use um, U.S. Cert. I'm not sure they're called that anymore because I'm really confused by all the, the new CISA names. Um, don't get me wrong, I love CISA. They're moving in the right direction, but um, they use their TLP. Traffic light protocol, right. and so that it helps to set the intentions and expectations around sharing. And so we'll say TLP read this, or you know, this is TLP Amber. Our our default at the Ren ISAC is always TLP Amber. So if somebody forgets to put something on their their email or on on something that they provide, you can assume it's TLP Amber. Now which, within the which and some people know the traffic like protocol and some people want so a TLP Amber for example is I share can, within your share own organization within my own organization right yeah. and typically for, and for for a purpose you know that uh, um, you know people that sort of sort of need to know basically yes you know? yeah okay. yeah. Uh, so, th so that helps us to, to bound expectations. And, um, and then there have been instances where it's just, it just happens. It's almost always unintentional where somebody shares to a list in their own, um, organization and, uh, and someone, people on that list are not Ren ISAC member representatives. So that goes outside the bounds and then we have to remind them and, you know, have yeah. them watch a, a video or, you know, um, usually what we have them do is we make them educate the community, like send a reminder out to people about it. Put them in some sort of special ISAC penalty box uh, that, that you've <laughs> created. We have a, yeah, the, 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 the nature of that sharing is first we have this, uh, this comment, Brian Kelly, sharing information about threats before they hit you is key. Think about tornado warnings. You want them before they hit your town and not uh, two months later. And, you know, and that I would, I would definitely, um, you know, here I can think about and share some experiences as an ISAC member. Yeah, you know, that that sharing is, is so super important. I'll give one of my own examples. Um, so worked in an organization I won't get terribly specific, but you know, we are an ISAC. We're a member of the healthcare ISAC, H ISAC. And um, there were these uh, denial of service attacks going through our industry. And to to this kind of exactly as he says it, uh, that that you know, we knew about a thing that was, you know, hitting people in our industry. 
I don't, I don't think it was two months, but a, about a month before, you know, having a similar set of things going on uh, directed towards us, you know, that that was very, very, that was helpful that, you know, you had a month to say, to look at some of that information being shared of, hey, this attack happened. You give your Michigan State example, like maybe not all the down the deep nitty gritty, but just to know that that happened. If maybe you were another Big Ten university, you know, we know that these attackers, when they find something that feels good and works, they're going to turn that crank as, as many oh, more yeah. times as possible. And just even to know that something happened and have some details about it to think I might want to tabletop this and get prepared. Um, or even do, do people reach out inside of those communities is what, you know, of knowing that it's, you know, this happened to Michigan state with that, would I, as a member, you know, know, have a path to reach out to them and say, can you answer some questions for me about this? Yeah, a lot of times we'll get requests, uh, who, who's a good contact at XYZ institution? And if somebody knows that that usually happens, they might post it to one of the discussion lists, the email list, but then that discussion happens between those two people and we don't all have to see it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we it, it starts as general, but then goes to direct communication sort of thing to protect yeah. people. I've also seen, um, and maybe you could talk about this when I think about the information shared. Um, I have found, I once upon a time worked with a team that did some original research uh, and, you know, looking for information about breaches or, you know, data being compromised. And that can be very challenging. Sometimes you find, you know, bad stuff. Uh, that you know is going on, but to take on the burden yourself, you know, when you're a researcher to say, I'm going to go save every one of the, you know, like I'm going to go do something to try to interact with and help every one of those organizations. It, it, that can be very messy and very time consuming when you're just a person out doing research on bad stuff, you know, to, to take on the responsibility. And so you know, maybe this is, uh, maybe we did something we weren't supposed to do, but, you know, when we knew that those folks were in a particular industry that sometimes we, you know, rather than go track down every person involved that we'd hand it off to, um, to an ISAC in their industry saying, you know, here at least somebody's getting the information about the you know, an attack in their industry and those, that organization might be a member or, um, you know, they, or that the ISAC might have a pathway to who's the right person and how do we convey this information in a way that, you know, the right person would understand. Is that, am I, am I doing ISAC wrong if we, uh, if you do that? No, and it's funny because I don't, that's, you know, when you hear about the goals of the ISACs and what we do, that probably isn't articulated, but we can help in that way. So we can help in a couple ways. If if I get something from a research organization or even from the federal government, like the FBI, um, saying, I need contacts at this university because we found blah, blah, blah. What I do, I don't, you know, so the information I do not share, let's talk about information I don't share. I don't share private information about the individuals at that university. So what I do is I contact them and say, hey, the FBI was asking about this situation or this thing, or this researcher was asking about this. It's on you. I'm giving this to you. It's up to you if you want to contact it and deal with it, contact them and deal with it. And, um, and so I step out of it. I, I hand it off and step out of it. Now, what I can do though, is if I get multiple ones of this. So this is where the research really comes in handy. If I get more than one, or if the researcher came to me and said, we saw seven of these, then all of a sudden, this is an issue that we might wanna deal with. So is there anything we can do to bring into our, our threat feed to help? Is there anything we can write up about it, an analysis report that we can write out that helps everyone? Because if it's seven people, it's more than seven people. If it's seven, it's at least seventy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ones, yeah. So, so, so we can, you know, again, keep, keeping it aggregated, but we can also make it, 
you know, look at it comprehensively and help more than more than the individual that that, that or more than the the institution than that person suggested. Okay, you mentioned and we might even work with a researcher and say, "What are you seeing? Is there anything else?" And then they might become one of our new partners, right? That's cool. Um, you mentioned you said threat feeds, um, and so this is one I I know about vaguely, I mean, all sorts of organizations, you know, vendors produce threat feeds, you know, there are, um, you know, different kinds of organizations that produce uh, threat intelligence feeds. So the ISACs produce, you know, I mean, do you, do you produce them yourself? Do you aggregate threat intelligence feeds from other organizations? You know, tell me a little more about how that works uh, and what I, what I get from an ISAC as a, as a customer in an ISAC industry. Ours all look a little different. So mine looks different from the multi-state ISAC, which looks different from the financial ISAC. Um, for the RAN ISACs, ours was built on an uh, NSF grant. And so um, it's, it's maybe a, a little more um, grassrootsy, uh, I would say. Um, but it's super effective. And what we love about it is it is it's based on aggregate information. So we have information sharing agreements with a lot of a lot of different organizations, some public, some private. And we aggregate that we dedupe it. And then we that becomes sort of the basis of knowledge. But the really cool thing that we do is you can add to it based on your own experience. So if you're um, bquuniversity.edu, you're seeing stuff. Do you like that one? <laughs> BQU. Um, Constructive you, Security University, CSU. There you, there you go, CSU. Yeah, I like that. Um, then you can give us that information, either single or, you know, single-handedly or um, through sharing, uh, through APIs, and then that's that goes into our collected body of knowledge. Now, the nice thing, the, so ours is called CES. They all have unique names, but ours is Security Event System. Uh, not so unique, but handy. Um, it explains exactly what we're doing. Uh, and so if you if you put information in there and CSU is not a known source for that information, what we do is we say, well, this, this data might not be quite as... Buyer beware. <laughs> ...trusted, so we're going to drop it to like a maybe 55% trust versus 100% trust if it's, you know, some, something from Cisco Talos. Just I was they, about to say, yeah, so you include vendor feeds like Cisco Talos or... You know some of the some of the big some of the big boys and girls that uh, that do that kind of research. Uh, I um, I'm not going to name names, but yes, we do. Oh. <laughs> okay, makes sense. All right, <laughs> cool. Um, and that's interesting too. So, and the, you know, the source of those things, you know, vendors, other, you know, members essentially can feed back into the their their stuff. You know, so if I'm if I'm CSU and I become one of those you know, I am a full member and I become a trusted member. I, you know, get bumped up in the priority because of my excellent uh, team of individuals. Like, I don't, maybe I, I have a, um, um, you know, I have some honeypot boxes out on the internet where I collect attack information and I feed that, you know, I'm going to feed yeah. that in my own systems and I'm also going to feed that back to, uh, that that could show up in the threat intel feed and say, um, yeah. you know, CSU is providing this, uh, into our feed and, you know, here, are this, here are things that were attacked on their network, uh, that might be attacked on your network as well. Yeah. Cool. Now, one thing that we, we don't do very well at this point is share across ISACs, um, with our threat intelligence, because we all kind of came, you know, we were siloed with our own solutions and um, we're just now getting to the point where we can think about that and talk about that going forward. And if any of my staff are listening, I know you guys are like, no, no, don't put this on our plate. <laughs> um, you but, heard it here. So like next week, probably <laughs> you're have that, gonna have that solved for. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so it's not, uh, that's not one of our goals for next week or you know, anytime soon, but, yeah. but think of the value if we can start doing that of, of the value we can bring the instantaneous, quick, relevant value we can bring to our members. And so I'm hopeful that we get there. Yeah. 
Uh, is there an ISAC for everybody? Uh, I think I looked, I had 21 in my head, but then I looked and counted, and I think I counted 25 uh, different ISACs for, for different industries. And you said critical infrastructure. Is it all only critical infrastructure? Uh, and uh, it's, it started with critical infrastructure, but now we're not really critical infrastructure. Research and education is a subsector of the governmental facilities, critical infrastructure. So, but we're so different from government facilities. We have yeah. different communities. We have different cultures. We have different histories. We have, you know, we cross sectors cause we have real estate, we have events, we have retail. And, um, so it, it just sort of, so we were sort of an early exception to that rule. And now we're seeing some other exceptions like, um, K-12 schools are establishing one, uh, tribe, uh, tribal areas are establishing a, an ISAC. And, um, so we see more and more of that. And then the ISOWs, which I know I you gonna, wanted. I was going to ask about that. I, you know, there's ISACs and ISOWs and they're like closer to a hundred uh, ISOWs, which I think includes the ISAC. I, that part I didn't get at all. What's an ISOW? An ISOW is inf information sharing and an analysis organization. Mm. And so, yes, the ISACs are a type of ISOW and we are the type, the critical infrastructure according to sector. Um, other ice house uh, might be, they, they just don't rise to, they're not critical infrastructure. Or the beautiful th thing about ice house is they can be re regional. So you could have a regional, as a matter of fact, you do have a regional ice house. You just don't call yourself an ice house. Uh -huh. Constructive security is a regional sort of ice house. Yeah. Um, we see that with, um, in higher ed, we see it with conferences. SEC might have their own sharing group, VT, whatever they're called, big Big 10, except it's not Big 10 anymore. Um, they have their own. Uh, so, you know, we, we just don't, they were already in existence. We didn't go back and name them ice owls, but you can register as an ice owl. Hmm. I don't know what it gets you. <laughs> maybe you get, to, maybe there's a badge that you get to put on your website that says you're there's, an official ice Maybe owl. there's like a cool party you get to go to <laughs> once a year. And, and which, which begs a question. Uh, if there was a party and all the ISACs and all the ISOWs uh, came together, who would be sitting, at, this is the real question, who would be sitting at the cool kids table, Kim? I mean, at Ren, without without a doubt, is at the cool kids table, but... Oh, yeah. I mean, do you, do you, let, do you guys sit with the FS ISAC, the financial services folks, or... Who are the cool? Who are the cool kids? And that's what I really want to know in the ISACs. I would say, not to be cagey about an answer because that's an awesome question. But um, <laughs> in a way, it depends. And and this is my legal background. I I'm really good at the it depends answer. Um, it depends on what your your topic is. So you know, I want some controversy on this question. <laughs> so sometimes it's something that the, the comms ISAC really is in a position to deal with um or the it isaac and so it, it kind of depends on your subject matter um more so than you know more so than constantly there's the constant echelons you know mm. it's very shifting um you know space isaac is one of the newer isaacs mm. and they're doing some some pretty cool work because they've got a lot of new energy around their organization, you know? So, uh, I pay, I pay attention to all, you know, I, I follow them on all the social media, maybe not Facebook, but, uh, and not TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, on LinkedIn and, um, Twitter definitely. And th th I'm just constantly surprised and amazed and educated by what they, they offer and the breadth of information that they, they share. Okay. Last question for me. Um, is it, is it very expensive to be, uh, an ISAC member? And, and I asked that question of should, should, should any, should everybody join? Should anybody join? Uh, or, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, is it very expensive or is there a level that I probably, is there a size of organization or a type of organization I really need to be before this is something that I would consider uh, joining an ISAC? Uh, 
There probably is a type, a, a size of organization where it just doesn't make sense. If you're a small proprietor, you're best following with what the state might offer. The state has good, re- your, your, your state has good resources. And so I would <laughs> encourage you to start there, go out to the, the state.gov website, um, find out what resources they have. Think about it from an all hazards. Think about cyber plus physical, not just one or the other. Um, certainly that's the bank for your buck. But as far as membership goes, almost every ISAC has a sliding scale of membership. So either, you know, ours is based on size of organization. Others, you can kind of say, well, I want to be a premium, a, a, you know, platinum member. So I'm going to yeah. <laughs> pay, pay this much. Um, you know, so I know, obviously, I know the RIN pricing structure the best. And uh, we're in the process of, of uh, updating our fees for the first time since 2013. Wow. So we've been a real bargain for a really long time. Um, and they're still, you know, uh, the most expensive is the price of a new Mac, you know, so I think it goes up to 3,500 now. Um, and then, you know, down to a couple thousand. Mm. Uh, so, you know, some room in between and, uh, and we try to make it affordable. And we also, all of us, all the ISACs, we, we're in the business of sharing. Sharing is caring, as you said on this this website, and we truly believe that. So, if we can figure out a way to share without running afoul of privacy concerns or without making um, confidential information known, uh, then we try to figure out a way to do so. And what what we often do is we'll we'll do an analysis report for our members, and maybe we'll do a webinar about that and be able to provide some focused learning on that, and then we'll rewrite it and just make it not you know, a little more general and make that available on our public website so that we can share a little more broadly. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, we've, it was a easy, fast conversation and I appreciate your time today. Um, how do I find out more about the, if, for, if I'm in the higher ed community, how do I find out more about Ren ISAC and, and what are you all are doing and become a member and all that good stuff? Uh, info at ren isacnet is our is our main uh, email address. And if you want to find out more about the ISACs, the best place to go is the National Council of ISACs. Awesome. Okay. Wonderful. Great conversation. Appreciate your time. And uh, always fun, Brian. Ha- ha- happy to have you back any other time. This was. Uh, I I want to put you to work on a real. This was too easy. A topic for you, I think. So uh, maybe maybe something uh, additional meat to it uh, next time. But a great conversation and something I think is really really interesting. Uh, awesome. Well, folks. thanks so, for your time. Yep. Yeah, take care.